Today we look into another conservation law, another pillar of classical mechanics called the conservation of momentum. Consider three objects that make up some system. And remember that a system is a mathematical and mental construct. It's not a thing that actually exists. It's a thing we put on the universe. So we can pick any three objects. Right? So just consider any three objects that make up some system. We can classify any force acting on one of the objects as being either internal, that is coming from things inside the system, or external, coming from things outside the system. And point, note that this is exclusive and dichotomous. There's, they have, every force must be one of these and can be only one of these. And then recall the, the system momentum is just the sum of the individual momenta. So P system is P1 plus P2 plus P3. Since the system mo momentum is the sum of the individual momenta, then the change in the system momentum is the sum of the change in the individual momenta, which of course is just saying the same as saying the change is each change is an impulse, so the change in the system momentum is just the sum of all the individual impulses that act. Then we can consider the impulse on one to come from either two or from three or for things outside the system, which is what I said before. Right? The impulse comes from two acting on one, or it comes from three acting on one, or it comes from stuff outside acting on one. And of course we do the same thing for the other two, just permutating the, the indices there. Thus the change in the system momentum is J1, that line, plus J2, which is that line, plus J3, which is this line, but I'm going to group them differently. For instance, if we consider just this, these guys grouped in blue, the impulse that 2 exerts on 1 is always equal and opposite to the impulse that 1 exerts on 2, because the time of interaction is clearly the same. It's the same interaction. And we know by Newton's third that each force is opposite to the other, but equal in magnitude. And so this whole thing becomes 0. But then the same argument works for this one, and the same argument works for this one. And then we look at this, and we say, well, these things together, the sum of the external uh, impulses on 1 and on 2 and on 3, is really just the sum of all the external impulses. So we end up with that the change in system momentum is equal to the impulse done by external forces, and that the internal forces do not contribute to a change in momentum. If there are no external forces, then the momentum of the system cannot change. It is conserved in the classic physics way. This gives us the law of conservation of momentum, which says that delta P equals zero for an isolated system. Some people like to write that instead by saying the initial momentum equals the final momentum, which of course is algebraically the same. All right, two boxes are tied together by a string and are sitting at rest on a frictionless surface. Between the two boxes is a massless compressed spring. The string tying the boxes together is cut and the spring expands, pushing the boxes apart. The box on the left has four times the mass of the box on the right, and our system will be pretty logically both boxes and the spring. When the string is cut, which box gains the most momentum? Well, we know that the initial momentum of the system equals the final momentum of the system, but the initial momentum of the system is zero. If we say that the boxes come off with a momentum P4 that way, and a momentum P1 that way, then we can say that the final momentum is P1 plus P4, but I have to remember that P4 is pointing opposite to P1, and so it has a minus sign. And you can see that this says that P4 in magnitude equals P1. So they have the same momentum, which we find a little counterintuitive. That's not how you expect to see the boxes move. And that's largely because your eye doesn't see momentum. Right? We can't instantly read the mass of things, so we only see velocities. When the string is cut, which box gains the most speed? Well. We can now just look at our thing and say, well, if P1 equals P4, but that means that this one has a speed V4 and a speed V1, then we have M1 V1 equals M4 V4, or V1 is the ratio of masses times V4, which is 4 to 1. So the one on the right goes faster. And this will be a general truth, that for two things that fly apart from a common start, the lighter one will be moving faster, which is maybe not that surprising. And then which box gains the most kinetic energy? 
Here we might say, well, the first guy has kinetic energy, which is, of course, 1 half m1 v1 square. And the 4 block guy has a kinetic energy, which is 1 half m4 v4 square. But we know that v4, the m4, is 4 m1. And we know that v4 is 1 quarter v1, but we square it. So now we have, oops. So now we have one half times, and we can pull out the four, and we can pull out the one fourth squared, which is sixteen, and then we still have m one, and we still have v one square, and I choose to group this instead. We have one quarter, one half m1 v1 squared, but of course that's just the original kinetic energy. Not the original, the one of speed 1. So the 4 mass has less kinetic energy than the, f the 1 mass. The 1 mass gains most. And that will also generally be true when two objects fly apart. The less mass of one carries off more of the kinetic energy. And it carries it off in proportion, in the inverse proportion to the masses. In other words, if it's a 1,000 to 1 mass ratio, then the lighter one gets a 1,000 to 1 of the energy. All right, Bob is running from the police and thinks he can make a faster getaway by jumping on a stationary cart in front of him, because Bob is not that bright. He runs towards the cart, jumps on, and rolls along the horizontal street. Bob has a mass of 75 kilograms, and the cart's mass is 25 kilograms. If Bob's speed is 4 meters per second when he jumps on the cart, what is the cart's speed in meters per second when he, after he has jumped on? Here we can say that the initial momentum equals the final momentum, but the initial momentum is just Bob's because the cart has zero. We solve this over and we find that we get that the final speed at the end is three meters per second. Two ice skaters, Sandra and David, stand facing each other on frictionless ice. Sandra has a mass of 45 kilograms. David has a mass of 80 kilograms. They then push off from each other. After the push, Sandra moves off at a speed of 2.2 meters per second. What is David's speed? So as usual, we draw a picture. Here they are before, here they are after. And again, we have that the initial momentum equals the final momentum because all the forces are internal. There are no external forces. It's Sandra and Davis put, putting on each other, pushing on each other. So the original momentum at the start is actually zero because nobody's moving. And the momentum at the end are these two. Uh, so we solve over. I've been uncareful with my sense of sign, so apparently I have chosen V Sandra to be the positive. So that's the plus direction so that David gets a speed, a velocity of minus 1.24 meters per second. Of course, his speed is just the absolute value of that. A 30 gram ball is fired from a 1.2 kilogram spring-loaded toy rifle with a speed of 15 meters per second. What is the recall speed of the rifle? In other words, the rifle is kicked back how fast if you weren't to have braced it. And by now, these are getting kind of familiar. We start off with the idea that we have the momentum being equal. Why? Because the spring pushes the ball forward, but it also pushes the gun back. That's all internal to the system. And then we solve over. Notice it's basically the same setup as the last problem. Be careful not to memorize this result. Right? It's, a, it's a true result, but it's only a true result in the cases we've been setting up. So don't memorize that. Start from here. Start from the momentum being equal. When we do this, we get a speed of, three point, of 0 0.375 meters. All right, both explosions and rockets are tricky to analyze via Newton's laws because the forces are complicated. They vary wildly in strength and size and in time and in places in the rocket and so on. It's billions and billions and billions of inter interactions giving rise to eventually the force out the back. But a lot of it can be understood from just simple momentum considerations. The complex interactions are all internal. The gas in the wall and all that all inside, as long as we define the system include all the parts, including the fuel. Therefore, the total momentum is conserved. A simple illustration of that is given here, where before we have a rocket and its fuel. The system is both of those things. And so we maintain the system as being both of those things. And after we've ejected fuel downward, so it carries some momentum downward, 
which means there must be some momentum upward to compensate, and that's what lifts the rocket. Of course, this is a little facetious because a little bit later we'll be burning some more fuel, but that extra fuel will already have some forward momentum, so it won't be as clean. We'll get less less yield. On the other hand, there'll be less mass, so these two things can can fight, and you can have the rocket continue to accelerate even though the fuel is getting less and less efficient per gram. All right, this is a correction from the New York Times about rocketry that they published on July 17, 1969. In essence, they had, in the 1920s, savaged Robert Goddard, who was the pioneer of liquid fuel rocketry, for making the audacious su suggestion that you could take a rocket to the moon possibly someday. And they mocked him mercilessly, which was unfortunate because they were thoroughly, thoroughly wrong. And on the day that the Apollo 11 mission mo launched towards the moon, the Times admitted they were wrong. Uh, as they say, they regret the error that they were fundamentally wrong on physics. All right. An explosion in a rigid pipe shoots three balls out of its end. A six-gram ball comes out the right end, a four-gram ball comes out the left end with twice the speed, and from which end, then, is the third ball? So we have something like this, and we know that the six-gram one comes out with some speed, but the four-gram one comes out going the other way with twice that speed. If we think in terms of momenta, we know that oops, the 6-gram ball comes out with, we'll still call it, say, 6v, but the 4-gram ball comes out with a momentum, which is 8v. On the other hand, the explosion means that there was no momentum at the start. They were originally at rest, and so the third one that comes out has to have enough momentum to make it zero. We have eight one direction and six the other. We need two more units, two V more units of momentum to make it balance out. So it has to have come out moving to the right. We don't know how fast because we don't know the relative masses, but we know that it will come out from the right. A mosquito and a truck have a head-on collision, splat, which has a larger change in momentum. but this is, as always, sort of a trick question here. They have the same change in momentum because in the collision they exert forces on each other, but those are internal to the system of mosquito plus truck. Now, of course, the mass of the mosquito is very small, so the acceleration that the mos mosquito suffers is huge, which is why it goes splat, and the truck hardly notices because its mass is giant. But they have the same change in momentum. All right, two boxes on a frictionless surface. They had been sitting together at rest, but an explosion between them, that's a lot of explosions in this chapter, has just pushed them apart. How fast is the two kilogram box going? And this is going to be as simple as zero momentum start is minus four meters per second times one kilogram plus two kilograms times the final speed. So we'll get the final speed would be two.